evening. My name is Lewis Powell, and it is my pleasure to come before you once again on behalf of the Cook County Bar Association, the world's oldest, and we enjoy saying this because it's true. We're actually technically the oldest African American Bar Association uh, in existence. Uh, founded in 1914 in the city of Chicago. And today we have the esteemed Mecca Thompson, Thomas, one of Thompson, <laughs> one of our rising stars. And I want to make sure I pronounce her name right because so, she'll you'll get upset with me. <laughs> but she deserves it because she, she's really working in all seriousness. She has worked very hard on behalf of the Cook County Bar Association. She's now on the board of directors, correct? Yes, I am. And she's earned that right to be on the board of directors, and the Cook County Bar Association is grown, grooming her for future leadership. Uh, Mecca, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I am an attorney. I've been practicing over 10 years now in Chicago. I practice in domestic relations, probate, real estate, and landlord-tenant. Um, and I graduated from undergrad from Loyola University with a a degree in political science and a minor in international studies and um, African-American studies and then I went to Howard University School of Law um, well before that I worked f uh, a year with Kirkland and Ellis that's one of the top uh, law firms here in Chicago um, and that was more doing a project assistant in a, in a you know minor role uh, with the attorneys there uh, I decided that I wasn't really that much interested in corporate law. So when I went to law school, I focused on just basic, uh, the, the basic courses that you need to graduate from law school. But my goal was to practice law in um, more domestic relations, family law orientated, um, and maybe something like bankruptcy. When I got out of law school, that was one of the first areas that I practiced mm -hmm. in was bankruptcy. Uh, but I found my footing in domestic relations and, like I said, probate estate. Um, I, I do. I think I do very well with the elderly and families, and so that's where I've been practicing in Chicago, primarily as well as some of the uh, uh, like uh, Will County and DuPage County courts. Well, that's a you know very wide background. Uh, Kirkland Ellis, you're right. Kirkland Ellis uh, is one of the larger law firms, um, what we call a. a blue chip firm, I'm right. using term, terminology. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, they make a lot of money. <laughs> but our, our colleague Mecca has made the decision. She's making a lot of money too, but she's doing it another uh, way. We really want you to call in. We really do. Now, if you don't call in, Mika and myself are going to have a good time talking, exchanging, and dialogue, and so forth and so on. But it's more fun, more you know, interactive if you call in. Today's topic is domestic relations. And I'm taking domestic relations. We're going to give you the Reader's Digest version, just enough to tease you to want for more information. <laughs> We're going to be covering, of course, marriage. We're going to be covering divorce. And we'll be covering, we'll be covering uh, to a certain extent, child support. The number to call in is 312-738-1060. 312-738-1400. Okay, now we want you to really call in and uh, and and talk with us. I guess actually, I want to make sure you get the number right. Three one two seven three eight one zero six zero. Okay. Mm -hmm. Again, we don't want you calling the wrong number. I'll make it. Just you know, start out. Who can get married? Okay. In the state of Illinois, um, according to the new law that was passed, that went into effect January of this year. Um, it was passed by legislation, Public Act number 990900, and it did make a lot of substantial changes to the current Marriage and Dissolution of, of Marriage Act. And um, one of the, what doesn't change is who can be married. Um, there, uh, prior to this act coming to pass, we had enacted in the state of Illinois a civil union law. And that allows people of the same sex as well as people of heterosexual relationships to enter into a civil union. Um, and that is still different than marriage. The new law does not change that. You have to be, uh, the requirements are still the same. You have to be 18 years of age. You have to have the legal capacity to get married. <laughs> you have to not have been... And uh, you uh, also um, cannot be closely related. 
Okay, let me ask you a couple of questions. We, we want to make it plain, plain enough so I can understand it, mm -hmm. and certainly informative enough for all this can to uh, enjoy it and, and and get something out of it. You said, I believe you said the legal capacity. Legal capacity. So um, you can't be of uh, unsound mind. You have to be able to enter into the marital relationship. So you have to be able to basically make the agreement declare that you mm -hmm. are going to marry X person. You have to be able to uh, uh, go to the uh, court and get a license. And those who are not citizens of this country would not have the legal capacity to enter into a marriage. Uh, in this country, if you're under the age of 18, you wouldn't have the legal capacity to get married. And if you are mentally disabled, you wouldn't have to get So those are some examples. What question? <laughs> Counsel, what about, you said a citizen. Mm -hmm. What about individuals, I may get the terminology wrong, uh, in terms of a green card, meaning that you have permission to reside in the United States and work in the United States, can those individuals get married? Well, under the law, um, they, if they meet the requirements for immigration status, um, and they can be uh, required as far as citizens of this country, you can get married. If you are seeking to marry somebody who is a citizen, I believe you then, have a call. Oh, okay. We'll come okay. back to that. And we'll come back to that. Caller, are you there? Hi, I have a question. Um, I'm going to get married next year, and I'm actually looking into a prenuptial agreement. And I was wondering, I, after looking through a few different lawyers, um, I found that most of their prices are about the same. So what's something that can help me or what kind of questions can I ask about these lawyers in order to decide which one will best fit my needs? Okay. And you're, you said you're looking for a prenuptial agreement? Yes. Okay. Do you have any children? No. Okay. And you have assets? Uh, I don't, but he does. He does. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. So the, the questions that someone in your position would want to ask is, okay, uh, the attorney that you are seeking, you first want to make sure that that attorney has never represented um, your soon-to-be husband so that there's no conflict of interest. You want to make sure that uh, the attorney has some background with um, a, a knowledge of the assets that your soon-to-be husband has. So that way he will be best in a, a best position to make sure that you get the, uh, the type of um, returns or if, if there's things in the prenuptial agreement, if, if your husband is the one that's preparing it, um, he understands the terminologies that are basically saying that you're not going to get X, Y, and Z pertaining to whether it's stocks, whether it's real estate, whether it's, uh, you know, they need to have some sort of background with regards to those assets. You would want to know, you want to first ask yourself what quest the questions um, so that you can in properly instruct the attorney um, what assets do you not, are you okay with not having access to? What asset, assets do you, do you feel that, you know, you should be able to share in of his? Uh, maybe there may be some um, time frames that are put into prenuptial agreements. And so after a certain amount of time, then you are, in, are able to share in certain assets of his. Um, is, what are the requirements uh, with regards to the children? Um, there are prenuptial agreements that uh, cover everything from the amount of sexual relations that you have and as well as uh, how the children are cared for. Um, some of them do spell out the terms in which uh, the conditions of if you divorce, you know, what happens with the children. So you have to be clear for yourself first. What am I okay with and what am I not okay with? And, and, and those are the things then you can properly, you know, advise the attorney as to what uh, things are negotiable. Um, a, a, a prenuptial agreements is all about the art of negotiation. If you're not really honest with yourself as to what it is that you want and what it is you don't want, then that agreement isn't going to benefit you regardless of how competent that attorney is. Um, you have to be clear about your assets. What kind of assets does he have that will put you guys both in a different tax bracket in the event that you divorce? Um, how will your assets be treated? 
Um, will he be able to share in, in what maybe whatever little things that you have? People sometimes don't remember pensions are assets. Um, if and then um, things that you, that um, you have before the marriage, though, legally in the state of Illinois, are not part of the considered marital property. Um, but um, be advised that um, to the extent that your spouse is the one that may be paying for different things that you may already own. For example, if, not saying that you have that, but if you had a home um, prior to the marriage, it's not um, part, it's not considered a marital asset. However, an argument can be made where the other person is paying the mortgage on the home after the marriage, that those mortgage payments um, should be considered um, assets that he or she has a right now to get a portion back um, to the extent he was able to pay off the house. Um, there's an argument that he, he, he has an ownership interest in the house now. So it really depends on not only what the assets are, but to the extent that you or he, he are assisting in the payment of separate assets that may have existed prior to the marriage. You want to make sure that those uh, your contributions are protected. Um, so um, those type of things. Um, and then they also need to be up to date with regards to the new law that has been enacted. Um, there have been some changes. The terminology has completely changed and um, the degree to which parents can share responsibilities with children. Um, you would want to get all of that clearly stated if you have any type of religious affiliations that you would like the children to participate in. You would want that clearly stated. Um, so really get a, a first thing is always to be clear as to what you want and that way you can best uh, advise the attorney and then make sure that the uh, attorney's uh, capacity background uh, matches, you know, experience matches the, the, the workload that they're going to have to take, take into account. And that is the assets, you know, that your, your soon-to-be husband has, as well as the different contractual uh, experience with negotiating, experience with negotiating those type of terms, those type of agreements. Very good. That was almost like a laundry list. <laughs> Very good. Carla, I hope she'll, hope, I think she, uh, Attorney Thompson ad answered your question. This new law, what is the, you, you, you see that the, the terminology has changed. Yes. Um, for example, it's um, no longer you, you have custody. No longer do you have um, the, it's parental responsibility. Um, but what do you have? So you can share basically with parental responsibility for children. That means now you can share, you can uh, divide up the different duties. For example, um, for the most part, a parent that is going to, um, the child is going to rely, reside with them, um, they will uh, still retain a lot of the parental responsibilities with regards to um, preparing the child for school, uh, making sure the child eats, sleeps, is, is clean, and so forth. However, um, usually that parent, the custodial, quote-unquote custodial parent, was the one that did the the going to the doctors, the schools, and so forth and so on. That no longer has to be the case. The other parent can be the, the, the primary parent that is registered with the school system and has parental response, uh, parental responsibility for uh, the education of well, the let child. Let me ask you this. So are you saying, okay, the, the old terminology, I believe the, the domestic relations is not my area. So my understanding was usually the person that has the primary custody of the youngster mm -hmm. is basically responsible for most of the things right. being registered for school mm -hmm. taking them to the doctor so forth and so on so counsel are you saying now that even though the, uh, the youngster may reside with one parent that the other parent can have the responsibility of registering the youngster for school now right. they, when that other parent the question that other parent is not the parent that, that, that physically has the child can the child be registered in the area that they live? Right. Now, yes, you can, you, if, right, if the child lives one place and the, uh, 
uh, the other parent lives in a maybe better school district, it can be put in the court order that the child is to be registered in the school district of his, the other parent's locality, even though the child is not primarily um, a resident of that Quick school. Quick question. <laughs> okay. There have been instances, say I'm going to just pick an example, the city of the village of Flossmore, mm -hmm. okay? Flossmore has a very good school system, mm -hmm. and from time to time, people are caught not living in the district right. in terms of the child living in the district. Now, would this be an exception? Because I understand you, right? The child could be living in Village A, and therefore, just use the father for example, father living in Village B, and the father, because he's living in Village B with a better school system, chooses to enroll the youngster in the, in the village that he's residing in because they had a better school system. Well, would I mean, that, would that be in allowable? those situations, the child will be able to um, visit with the other parent. So um, they will technically be, quote unquote, living with the other parent. It's just not for the full time. Mm -hmm. And so the courts are in a, in a position to say, uh, Yes, the, this child is spending so much time with the, the father and the child is spending so much time with the mother. We are going to designate that the school system that this child will go to is the, the father's school system and put it in a court order that the, the school system can then respect. It, uh, the arguments really were ag that were against that was because no one's paying taxes, but that's not the case. The thought somebody is living when these cases are are going to come mm -hmm. up. And again, let's be re understand that this is a new law. There is no case law interpreting this, these statutes yet. So everything that I'm giving you is statutory discussion as far as what the lawyers have discussed it um, that I have um, um, put this law together. And they contemplated that um, these situations, when they come up, somebody is paying the taxes. It's not that um, neither parent is living in the district. It's both of the parents, one of the parents live in the district, so they are paying taxes toward that school system. Oh, yeah, so yeah. thereby, there is no argument that they're not, the child's, one of the parents is not contributing mm -hmm. to the tax base. They are contributing to the tax base. And uh, what's happened in the past is that those contributions, they don't get any benefit back where the child is a resident of the, the mother. And even though the father is, is paying toward those taxes, he, his, his kids can't go there simply because the child is spending more time with the, the mother. And um, so the courts are now in a situation where they can say, yeah, he, they can go very, and, and take advantage of the taxes that the other parent is paying. Very, very interesting. Because in our suburbs, we have a lot of that going on. Right. Now, you know, counsel, we want the audience to get their money's worth. I'm going to give you rapid fire. Okay. So <laughs> rapid fire and get some Reader's Digest responses so folks can get a teaser uh, in terms of what this new law is, mm -hmm. uh, now, what, what what is the name of the new law? Is it a new? It's just the it's, it's still the uh, marriage. It's the um, the um, <clears throat> the the Mar Illinois Marriage and Dissolution Act. It's still of nineteen seventy nine. They amended it, so there are provisions in the act pertaining to like I, like I said before, um, the legal terminology and um, uh, the waiting period. Um, the type of evidence that can be introduced, those provisions have been changed. But the, the bulk of the law is still there. So it was an amendment. rapid fire. Okay. Now, under the new law, after the, uh, the, the case has been settled, can it be modified? The the the, the the more the the agreement the, agreement. the marital agreement um yes the mo there can be some modifications to the marital agreement it, that's the same as before however if if it depend now what's happened is since you since we had the law this year it went into effect this year we of course, have a caller a, okay call are you there yes go right ahead yes uh, my question is. I've been had a, a case going on for like five years for a personal lawsuit case. Okay. And every time it seems I, I went to uh, to a hearing at one point, and I was supposedly awarded twenty thousand dollars, 
Okay. Is this on? Okay. Caller, caller. We only have a couple of minutes. We want to make sure that you're on point in terms of the topic. Is this is this your question regarding divorce or marriage? No, either one. This is just a personal um, injury lawsuit okay. that I have going. We will have that topic on another show. We only have a couple of minutes, and we want to really be mindful and respectful of the of the of our time. So we're going to ask you to call back at another time when we're covering that topic. Can you do that for me? Because we only got yes, three sir. minutes. You just want to get out the information that we can. Okay, thank, right, you. thank you. Okay, counsel. In terms of property dis distribution or dissolution, any changes on that? Property dissolution or dis distribution? distribution. Mm -hmm. um, the property distribution, um, it really is more of the... Um, the evidence you can do uh, with regards to property allocation, um, there, uh, the, the courts will be required to provide specific factual findings regarding property allocations. Um, the, the, they will also help the appellate courts better un understand the trial court's rationale for evaluating on appeal. Um, and so they, before they would just basic, some, some of the orders, the, the agreements may have just stated, um, this property goes to this person, this property goes to that per person, but they, now they need to specifically say, I find that this property goes to this person for these reasons. The evidence shows that this person had the property before, or the evidence shows that this person paid the most, you know, whatever those factual findings are. So you have to you have to specifically state uh, in the order what those factual findings were. So that's going to uh, uh, help Very with that. Very good. Hold, I mean to cut you off, we want to try to get as much as we can. How about post high school expenses? I.e. educational expenses. Any changes? No, the 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 high school expenses. Now um, you can um, uh, the the um, both of the parties can pay as well as the child. Um, they can also pay for high school. Oh, you talking about high school? I'm thinking college. Sorry, high school expenses. Um, yes, again, the parental responsibility can be levied against either parent. So one parent can take all of the responsibility. Under the old law, it was 50-50. You know, each person does it. But you can shift that over. Some can take um, a, a larger portion of that versus having, you know, the other person is the one that's covering the medical. You see what I'm saying? So that they can they can divvy it up as they, they choose versus, you know, one person being over it and, and the other person not, or just the just the the 50-50 split. For Very the, good. The How school. about disabilities? Any change with that in terms of children with disabilities? The courts, Any new rules? The courts will uh, look at evidentiary hearings. Now, under the new rules, um, they can look at, you know, the income and not have an evidentiary hearing. Just bring your tax returns and all your, you know, your, your financial information in front of the judge. Um, it used to be a war of the financial experts. Um, with regards to that, um, but um, so that will hopefully cut some costs for some of the litigants, where they can just bring the attorneys can bring in the financial records and bring them in the form of exhibits. However, with what you're talking about, uh, the courts would probably need to do an evidentiary hearing um, for that, um, so that they would know what the medical issues, in addition to the expenses attached to those medical issues for special needs children. Very good. We have approximately 60 seconds. You had the last word. Okay. Um, if you are in need of uh, a divorce or child support, I encourage you to speak with the licensed professional that is, that is practicing in domestic relations. The law has changed, and so you need to have someone that has been practicing in this area and knows the changes and can properly advise you. This is not the time to try to do this on your own. Well, very good. Counsel, as always, you, you, it's been a pleasure having you. Please tune in next week at the same time when your bar association, the Cook County Bar Association, will be here bringing you information you can use. God bless you.